he was created for destruction. So to be inherently bad, I don't think it's a permanent sentence and I think that's okay. And you are locked into another episode of the Amelia Podcast. My name is Josh, and we are glad to be back with you this week for a, another inspiring, encouraging, and insightful discussion. And I am live here, and I'm here with my lovely wife, Rebecca, as always. Hey! And so, Rebecca, we talked a little bit um, a couple weeks ago about spring and the newness of everything, uh, but you're actually going to kind of like do a whole garden herb thing. Now, I might get a little bit of flack here, but you haven't had the best luck when it comes to like growing in plants. Uh, no, I definitely own up to that. Um, <laughs> yeah, not the best. I, I do better with in-ground plants more so than with um, potted plants mostly because I'm like really excited the first couple of weeks that they're out there. And then all of a sudden I'm like, Ugh, it's so much trouble. <laughs> I don't want to go out there every single day and water these plants. Um, and so I do much better with uh, in-ground plants where they can draw up the water from the ground. Um, and I don't have to water them every single day, but potted plants are solely reliant on me. and. Um, <laughs> I want to be a potted. Pl I want to be a plant person, um, but I, I'm I'm not really that much of a plant person. So and and that's okay. I mean, you've been able to keep the one plant alive, which is the rosemary plant. Well, until I mowed over it accidentally, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, but until then, you you did a really good job. Oh, thank you. It did it mostly on its own. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one other thing that. Uh, some of you may not know is uh, Rebecca comes from a very talented family. One of her family members is actually a singer. Um, and we've had her on the show before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's Julie. an opera singer. Yeah. And so we went to the Scrimmel Horn a few weeks, uh, a couple weeks ago uh, to see her solo act, and it was a lot of fun. Um, again, to see her, always like supporting her. And we always like to be cultured, going to the fields and then going to the <laughs> opera. What did you do last night? What well, I went here. <laughs> um, but enough about that. We want to get right into it today. Um, you may be wondering why we are kind of like dressed as we are. Well, that's because we have a very special guest. And the topic and the movie we'll be talking about. But before we get into that, we want to bring in our guest, Paris from Paris Cosplay. Hello. <laughs> hey, Paris. Thank you so much for being on with us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm super excited. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we wanted to have our audience get to know you a little bit. But before going to um, asking you a few questions, what is the movie we'll be talking about today? We're going to be talking about, I don't think you guys can guess it, but <laughs> Lilo and Stitch. Yes. <laughs> yep. So, Paris, uh, as it turns out, they not planned at all. You are dressed as a Lilo. And <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying to get into the festivities by wearing a floral Hawaiian shirt. Rebecca is, also has her floral attire on as well. Yes. Yeah, my mom, uh, my mom actually brought back this little clip um, from Hawaii. <laughs> she loves Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so very similar. It's the phone. Awesome. All right, Rebecca, let's go ahead and get into our interview so we can learn more about Paris. Fantastic. Yeah. So the first thing we typically ask our um, our guests that come on is just a really open-ended question. Um, but just tell us a little bit about yourself. I know specifically that um, you're into cosplaying. Um, so yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so a little bit about me. Um, I am a cosplayer, so I um, make content on social media. So I do Instagram, I have a Patreon, I also do TikTok. Um, and so I really enjoy creating content and posting it. Um, really, my goal is to have a family friendly um, space for people to come and everyone is welcome. Um, so that's kind of the, the niche that I have over there. 
Um, and then I also, as you know, because um, I know you're studying for your LPC, um, for my day job, I'm a licensed professional therapist. Um, so that's what I do for my day job. And I work with um, children ages, I think my youngest right now is actually two years old. So I work with people from age two up into like um, mid adults. Uh, so that's something that I enjoy as well. Um, what else? What makes me interesting? I guessed at uh, conventions and um, oh, all of the things. So yeah, this is a little bit about me. I have a awesome. lot. Of, I wear many hats, I feel like. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you're kind of uh, very eclectic in the things yeah. that yeah. that you enjoy doing, um, mm-hmm. which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And wow, two years old. That's a really young client. Mm -hmm. It sounds like maybe a lot of observation. Yeah. uh, Mostly that's going to be your child-centered play therapy. It's all going to be tracking and uh, looking for themes, patterns. Um, But yeah, my favorite age to work with is actually four, which is super ironic because a lot of therapists, oddly enough, don't really enjoy working with kids. Um, I feel like a lot of people don't understand kids but for me it's like really fun and exciting and I really enjoy seeing their progress and um, helping them learn new skills like how to lose and not be a sore loser and and things like that is like really fun Um, which I feel like we're going to talk about too with Lilo and her temper tantrums and what those mean Um, I think it's so important uh, to try to understand those young minds better and to empathize with them and comfort them and give them a safe space yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's um, it's so important. If we can teach them right early on in life um, mm-hmm. how to handle their emotions, how to have healthy behaviors, then that's the best case scenario. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Help them be more adjusted. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So going back to um, cosplaying, um, so typically cosplayers have to go through or have like a, an essential bag um, with all their essentials in it. Um, I know I used to do that. So I I feel like I'm, I'm very eclectic as well. Um, but actually, <laughs> I went, I did a program once um, for makeup artistry and did like a couple of jobs. I've done jobs of, for makeup artistry and you always had like your bag of stuff. And I had like crazy stuff in there that was like, hey, you, you never know when you're going to need this. Um, so what's in your bag? Yeah. I actually usually, before I do a convention, I have like a checklist to make sure I don't forget anything. So I'll be like, okay, wig, costumes, shoes, accessories, uh, tights. Like literally I'm like, okay, make sure I have everything so that I don't forget anything. Um, And most of my cosplays I actually store in clear bags and I try to keep everything in it so I could just grab it and go. But you want to double check it to make sure you didn't take something out for another cosplay and things like that. Um, in my like essentials bag that I have for like every cosplay, I'd say, um, I, not every cosplayer does this, but I do always wear dance tights. I feel like it just kind of snatches the look and makes it look a little more clean. And I don't have to shave my legs every time if I don't feel like it. Um, so (laughs) I always wear dance tights, uh, wig brushes, a steamer, um, for your cosplays and for your wigs, um, teasing combs, let's see, hot glue, You always want to have bobby pins in case of emergencies, contact lenses. Um, This is bad, but Red Bull is probably in my my go bag. Um, So, yeah, that would be for just like generic cosplaying. And then for cons that I'm guesting at, I've got like my banner stands, my table um, sheet. I've got my prints my um my cards uh so yeah it just depends on what exactly i'm doing but my my go bags are suitcases they're not they're not like purses <laughs> 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 they're pretty big <laughs> yeah i yeah you need a lot that yeah. sounds like a lot of stuff yeah uh, definitely so that's cool so speaking of of conventions um what's it like being at conventions Oh, it's so much fun. So I'm actually pretty silly. Um, Even when I'm a guest, I'm known for running around and leaving my booth a lot. So it's kind of hard to catch me sometimes because I'm a very like present 
person and I very much prioritize fun. Uh, so I love to run around and see all there is to do at cons. So there was like one con I went to, I think it was HGX. They had like Dance Dance Revolution, which because of that con, I have since got really good at Dance Dance Revolution. I, I can do like expert mode now. And I was like, that's so fun. And then I'll check out like the VR and then I'll go see like what like uh, what the the gamers are doing. And then I'll go see like what everyone has to offer, um, spend money on merch, all of the things. And then um, as far as being a guest, being at your booth, signing prints, meeting guests, um, chatting with them. I love when people come to the booth and like talk about um, the Beneath the Tangles podcast too, which y'all know I was a, a co-host on before we sadly ended it. Um, but I love talking to people about the podcast and um, a lot of people, actually my husband recently was at a con with me and um, he noticed a lot of people will come uh, because I'm a Christian cosplayer. Um, so a lot of people will come to the booth and be like, oh my gosh, I love that you're a Christian cosplayer. And, you know, it, it's a, again, a safe place for like that community. Um, so I love cons. Like, I think they're fun. And I also feel like an elevated version of myself. Um, typically, I'm pretty, I feel like I'm pretty calm and chill. But like at cons, I'm like, very hyper and like, let's go. So I get to be like more upbeat and exciting and crazy. Yeah, there's a special <laughs> energy at cons. Oh, absolutely. There it yeah, is. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Definitely elevated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know we went to our first con like last year. Yeah. And like just seeing everybody on mm-hmm. those, um, there are different cosplayers, uh, different uh, voice actors that we got to need and the merch. I mean, I just like a kid in a candy store, honestly. Wow. Nine times out of 10, I think most cosplayer stories is they went to a convention and got addicted. Like that's my story. <laughs> I went to my first con and I was like, this is my new personality. Like this is where I belong. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I love conventions. I think they're so much fun. Awesome. Yeah. And there's like, it feels like there's a place for everyone too when you mm-hmm. go. Um, it's like, no matter what your fandom is, there's a place for you. And I just love that inclusivity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's like trading card cons, pop culture cons, anime cons. Um, so yeah, you're right. There's like all different types of places for everyone. And they all have different environments too. Like mm-hmm. the communities mm-hmm. are all a little bit different. So that's kind of fun too, to see like the different communities like the subcultures within the big culture, I think is really cool. Yeah, that's so true. There are so many different subcultures um, within that. Yeah. So you talked about being a a Christian cosplayer, um, but um, how does your faith actually influence your cosplaying? Yeah. So I think, you know, of the verse, you know, in everything I do, do so in the Lord. So I eat, breathe, you know, all, everything in the Lord. So that's kind of how I see it um, is I feel like my faith influence every aspect of my life. And so I'm kind of seeing cosplay through a Christ lens. Um, actually, Beneath the Tangles helped me a lot with that, too, because when I first started Beneath the Tangles, it was like, anime and Christianity. I honestly thought it was a strange concept. I was like, what? Um, but being a part of the podcast too really helped me integrate watching media through a Christian lens and looking for those parallels and seeing um, Christ and biblical themes in media, I think was really cool. So I'm grateful for the podcast for helping me broaden my lens in that way. Um, So yeah, I think it influences my cosplay a lot, especially like I said, I try to have a very family friendly relationship. content i try to make things uh that to where kids can watch it and their parents will be fine with it and um, i try to spread like positive messages and um and in that way i feel like it does influence uh my cosplay and my content for sure yeah i love that you mentioned that you know everything you do do it for the lord and how that really influences you but yeah first on that too what you were saying there there's a verse like think on these things that are holy think on these things that are pure and um in doing so you will um uh, like be uh christ-minded or have the mind of christ um and i think that's so important like whenever we're doing like a podcast we talked about this i think just a couple hours before coming up here we are who we surround ourselves with what we watch what we read what we listen to yeah and there's a difference though when i feel you're doing it passively Mm. and then when you're doing things when you're looking at through a lens Mm -hmm. like we're watching one animation like that we would never normally watch 
But why are we watching it? Well, we're looking for the parallels. We're looking for the different imagery. And how can we use this, um, which um, is not very Christian, but how can we direct it towards a Christian message or a faith-based message? Mm -hmm. It's really cool, too. Even when I, So I went to seminary. I went to Dallas Theological Seminary. Um, and one of the things one of my professors taught us was literally how to look for um, Jesus in music or even the lack of Jesus in music. And it was really impactful for me because I think sometimes Christians get a bad reputation for being judgmental. And I think looking through a Christ lens of how we can show grace and be loving um, can still be very impactful. Um, I loved my seminary because our professors would tell us like, if you cringe at curse words and if you wince at like bad things, like not in a like conviction kind of way, but like if you hear a curse word and you're like, ugh, she's like, you need to go listen to a bunch of curse words because you're going to be exposed to that and you need to know how to love them. And I really love that because I was like, okay, this is showing us how to not judge and to be loving and to have grace and to show that love um, in spite of. And so I feel the same way with media is like, um, and I might be wrong, like God may correct me, but I kind of feel like God's not like, Ew, every time he hears like a curse word or like sees blood, because like it's all like the Bible is like insane, right? Um, so I don't think he condones it, but I think he would see it through a different lens, if that makes sense. And so for me as well, it's like, I try not to be judgmental. I try to be like, oh, how can I be a positive influence? Or how can I um, be a vessel or a tool um, without being too pushy, just being like, Hey, I respect you. Um, this is this is what I believe. Does that make sense? I I probably rambled a little bit, but yeah, no, no, no it makes perfect sense. Yeah, it does. It makes perfect sense. I remembered what I was gonna say. Um, so in the I'm reading a book right now um, called Embodying Integration by Neff and McBen, and um, one of the chapters in the book is talking about. Um, it's like, it's talking about how do we share the gospel? And it's not as much about speaking the words necessarily of like literally going out and, you know, saying, telling people about the gospel. Mm. Obviously it is that, but it's more about a state of being that yeah. the great commission actually started with God in the beginning where the father sent the son to the earth and then the father and the son both sent the Holy Spirit to be with us and that that is the mission of God and we are just partnering with that and so it becomes more of a state of being rather than simply doing and um, I actually wrote about beneath the tangles and and our podcast in my in my paper because I was like because it they talked about um, Jesus being a Jewish man in a Jewish culture who came to um, download basically or interpret the divine message and um, that he was primarily speaking to the Jewish people because he was a Jewish man. But God, obviously, he came for the whole world. Um, we see Peter in Acts 10, I think, um, where he is then commissioned to go to the Gentiles and um, to then continue that interpretation of the divine message to the Gentiles. And so that brings in um, redemptive analogies like we do here and like Beneath the Tangles does and um you know you even speaking through your cosplaying um it opens up the world of christianity to the geek community really you know mm -hmm. it's all the anime lovers and the cosplayers and the furries and the sci-fi yeah. fan lovers and you know all of that it offers a new perspective on things and mm -hmm. hopefully grabs people's attention in a new and different way Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like that. And I think based on what you're saying too, it's like meeting people where they're at and walking with them rather than like talking at them. Cause I don't even think it's productive to like lecture or talk at people. Even, you know, Jesus used a lot of parables to help people understand. And he kind of met people where they were, not where he expected them to be. 
Um, so even with like with a lot of my clients, um, I try to like, I mean, as a therapist, you really listen first and you give them the space to like, you listen and you just hear the story and you reflect back and you show them that like, I see where you're at. And then you offer some options like, well, what about this? Well, what about that? Um, and so with my faith, I try to, you know, say, especially if I know they're not a believer, I'll say, how about this? Like, can I pray with you? And if you feel like that was super weird, let's never do that again, then okay. Like we don't ever have to pray again, but why don't we try it? See how you feel. And literally I'd say nine times out of 10, they're like, oh yeah, you could pray every time. That was awesome. Uh, so it's, I think too, like not being too pushy, like, cause people feel judged when we're like, listen to the Bible. It's like, oh man, like that's really, uh, makes them feel, I think, shame. And I don't think we're we're called to make people feel ashamed. I think we're supposed to show them like who they truly can be. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. It's that person-centered theology uh, mm-hmm. or person-centered therapy, really. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, super important. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So so going back to to cosplaying, um, what do you feel like is the most challenging and or the most rewarding part? of what you do with cosplaying. Yeah, so the most rewarding I think is the community and I say that a lot. It sounds like such like a pageant answer, but it's true. Like I love the community. I love all the friends I've made. I think literally almost all of my friends except for like childhood friends are through cosplay or through princess parties. Uh, which yeah, I did want to give a shout out to the fairy tale headquarters because this is their costume and I did a Lilo party today. Um perfect but yeah, yes, perfect timing. Um, so I'm really thankful for all my friends that I've made th- in the community and um, opportunities to like being on this podcast, I would see as an opportunity. Um, I've really gotten a lot of really cool, interesting opportunities out of this. Um, the most challenging, um, th- this, this is for me specifically, probably not everyone, uh, but for me it would probably be burnout. Um, like I said, I wear a lot of hats and so I do have Patreon and I used to release like three to four sets a month. Now I release two a month and I'm sticking to that this year cause I get burnt out and sometimes I get really tired. Um, I haven't been keeping up as much with like reels or tiktoks because sometimes i just don't feel like doing them and i've noticed like you can tell when i don't feel like doing them like i look like miserable like a robot like like (laughs) pretending like i want to do a dancey dance so i think um uh burnout and and i have this problem of like go 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 um so i could probably manage that better but uh my friend explained, she said, Paris, it's like when you're in a video game and you use all your resources at once and then you don't have any resources and then you're kind of like, duh, 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 duh. and then you have to like build up your resources and then you use it all again. Or like mana. I use up all my mana and I have to like sit there and wait for it to like build back up again. And uh, so, yeah, I'm very like, <sighs> so that would be my, my biggest challenge is um, probably uh, balancing. But I also kind of in a weird way think it works for me. Like it's just. I've kind of accepted that that's just how I am. So if you don't hear from me, I'm like dwelling in the corner until I get my mana back up. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. it's nice. good to take some some recharge, right? The mm-hmm. the Sabbath is a good practice mm-hmm. to to have. So you go for a long time and then you just rest. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I feel with being like uh, a content creator like Paris, like you, like us, uh, people from the Nathan Tangles, we do suffer from burnout mm-hmm. and we want to, but we still want to be consistency. Like I know like for ourselves, like there are a few episodes that like just didn't hit and it was because we were just burnt out. We didn't do like a lot of things that we usually do for the show and we want to put it out still. And Hey, if it gets views, it gets views. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, but yeah, burnout is just a, uh, it's just a part a part of life and i think i think content creators face more burnout Mm -hmm. than maybe other professions because i think you're trying to be okay what's the next big thing okay what's sticking what's working um how can i make this a little bit um how can we report this this like us we didn't really get on like reels and such and tiktok until like a few months ago yeah and i think what's hard too is the industry is constantly changing so like Mm -hmm. 
I'm a researcher, so like I would be very well and up to date and informed with the algorithm. But then the yeah. algorithm is always changing, so it can mm -hmm. sometimes be frustrating. Or for me, like I really loved the the, the season of like the. 15 second videos because I could easily sit there and crank out like 30 videos like 10, 15 second videos and silly audios but now what's trending is the long form content and the story times and I'm not as maybe I would be if I tried but it takes more effort for me personally and I'm like oh I'm not interesting enough like I kind of liked being a character because in my TikToks I'm just like a silly little character uh so now it's like that original long form, like personal and um, that personal piece is a little more, uh, I'm actually surprisingly like a pretty private person. So I'm like, oh, mm. how can I be personal and still be a character? Right. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's another frustrating part is that the industry is constantly changing and you got to keep up with it. Yeah. And going back uh, just to uh, jump off on uh, the personal versus private like, yeah, you want to let people know, you want to invite them to somewhat of an intimate space, but you're also got to keep in mind, it's like, okay, how much information is too much? <laughs> it's like, do I have my address and my background? No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I battle with that a lot, actually, because I have, like, again, a lot of hats. And mm -hmm. I'm like, I was just talking to Charles from Beneath the Tangles about this, mm -hmm. on, honestly, because he feels like I have a really powerful uh, testimony and that I yeah. could share it and do more with it but then there's a part of me that's like i think honestly probably afraid of like who i feel like my story is also like i, I don't want to hurt people who are connected to my story if that makes sense um so i'm like protective of others as well yeah um so it's interesting it's like okay what do i share what do i keep close mm -hmm. Um, cause you'll know a lot of, a lot of, you'll know, I love cats. You'll know that I'm a Christian. You'll know like everything you need to know, but there's some things that I keep to like my inner circle. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, um, unfortunately we're going to have to end the interview cause this is a no cat podcast. So I don't know. Y'all don't no. like cats? <laughs> no, no, no. That is not true. Ah! No, no. I like cats. <laughs> I, I I'm unfortunately Except maybe hairless cats. I'm unfortunately, sure. I'm I'm allergic. So oh man, yeah, I'm a crazy cat lady. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I'll I'll go ahead and get to our last interview question uh, here before we get into our discussion. So, in a number of videos on Instagram and other social platforms, you've been seeing cosplaying balloons. Um. I know there's a story behind that, so please <laughs> um, explain what this is, how it got started. Yeah, so another shout out, uh, Balloon Josh. He has like 2 million followers on TikTok, which is crazy because when we first started doing the balloon cosplays, it was actually on my account and I was like, Josh, you need to get over here. Like there's a platform for you here. And now he's like blown up and I'm so proud of him. Also, congrats to Balloon Josh. He just had his uh, first baby boy. And so he has a newborn right now. Um, but yeah, he's been doing, uh, balloons, I think for 30 years. Um, so he's been doing it since he was, I think nine years old. And, um, we did our first, uh, balloon. I'll tell his story, uh, first. So he first thought of the idea of the balloon dress for a, a, um, fundraiser. So it was a breast cancer awareness and he made this pink dress and it was like, you could donate to pop pieces of the dress. Um, and so it was like this kind of fun thing. Um, but then it was actually during um, COVID when we started collaborating a lot more because um, everyone was like shut in and I was on unemployment. So I didn't have a job at the time. And um, we were cranking out like three to five balloon dresses a week cosplays. Um, so that was a lot of fun. And uh, we'd make our little TikToks and do our little dancey dance. But yeah, Josh makes the he's very respectful. He makes the balloon dresses like he twists them around me. So he already has like my measurements and everything memorized. Like you take this many balloon links to make a dress, which is really silly. Um, and we're we're very uh, random with it. Like people are like, do y'all plan them out? And it's like, no, we're like, what wigs do you have? What cosplay can we do with this wig? And I show up the next day and it's really hilarious. So um, he's he's such a fun person to work with and I adore him. That's awesome. And he's also a Christian. He actually has a degree in... Um, I think it's student ministry, but I might oh. be wrong. Or youth 
ministry. He has like a youth ministry degree. So that's a fun fact about Balloon Josh. Nice. 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 Mm-hmm. Well, shout out to Balloon Josh. Um, I, again, I know we've seen a lot of his uh, creations um, on you, of course. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right. Well, now that you all have gotten to know Paris a little bit, we're going to go ahead and get into our discussion on Lilo and Stitch. Uh, again, as we said, we're all adorned in our uh, Hawaiian apparel. We're going to go on a Hawaiian roller coaster ride. <laughs> so buckle up. <laughs> um, now but, all I can think about is that song, Josh. Uh, no mm. place to ride the <laughs> then I'll, um, I'll stop. I don't want to get a copyright strike. Um, okay. Um, so, Rebecca, for those who may have not seen Lilo and Stitch, where if you haven't, what are you doing? Go watch it right now. Then come back. Um, what is the overall synopsis of Lilo and Stitch? So Lilo and Stitch follows the story of a spirited Hawaiian girl named Lilo who adopts what she believes to be a stray dog, but is actually a very mischievous alien creature named Stitch. Stitch, genetically engineered for chaos, crash lands on Earth and ends up in an animal shelter. Despite his destructive tendencies, Leo, Lilo sees potential in Stitch as a friend and a pet, teaching him about love and family. And this came out, oh gosh, what was it? 20, it was the 2010s or, no, no, actually it was earlier than that. I think this came out yeah. when I was still in high school, maybe. I, I, think, I think that's true. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's been a while since I've seen this movie, and I'm like, glad that we did. One thing we noticed is that when we watch Disney movies or animated films as a kid, it's like, oh, haha, that's funny. Oh, I would love this part. When you watch that as an adult, there are moments in this movie that hit a lot harder than I remembered. I know, and Paris, <laughs> you, you had messaged us the other day. It's like, it always makes me cry. Like, oh, I always cry. cry. I, I watched it this morning, actually, and I was, like, crying. Oh. I was like, it's sad. <laughs> um, I know when Becca's crying because I can always hear, I can always feel a little bit, like, shaking. And it's like, There's an earthquake. <laughs> you can hear the, the, the trying to hold it in. Shaking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's oh, I don't know. It's so silly. Like I don't know why I'm like I can't let Josh know I'm crying. Don't do <laughs> it. That's so funny. Uh, well, when we were discussing like the different themes, we had a few different ideas. But one thing that we really want to touch on is goodness. Like, what is good? What is you know chaos? How are we good? What do we need to be good and in good graces? So, Rebecca, if you want to go ahead and start us off on this. Yeah, we're starting off strong here. Um, (laughs) I saw this as like the main question because in the very, very beginning of the story, um, we've got the head of the galactic whatever federation. Mm -hmm. I forget her name. But she says to Stitch specifically, give us a sign that you have some good in you. And of course, Stitch proceeds to then say whatever he said in the alien language, and everyone <laughs> freaks out, and they're like, "Look out, Lila Krista!" Like, there's no good in you whatsoever, and um, <laughs> and then he crash lands on Earth, and then it's like, "Ooh, what is goodness? How do I?" fit in yeah stitch's um, bad meter was unusually high for some yes. of his eyes there was a drawing <laughs> exactly yeah and that's how he was created right mm-hmm. that's how his um was J- joppa uh, right? jumba. Mm-hmm. jumba um mm-hmm. yeah that's how jumba created him um you know he was created for destruction very specifically and then when he lands on earth um, there's there's really not much that he can actually destroy. So what does he do? What's his purpose? Um, and he just feels really lost. And um, it made me think a lot about the the lost sheep and God going to to get that lost person and bring them into the family. And um, I thought a lot about that with with Stitch specifically. 
I liked the parallels between Lilo and Stitch too, because um, mm -hmm. prior before, prior to meeting Stitch, you see all the tantrums that Lilo is having, and she's just like the most wild child I think I've ever seen in my life. So why do you sell me by a rabbit instead? At least a rabbit will behave better than you. Go ahead, then you'll be happy because it will be smarter than me too. And quieter. You'll like it because it's stinky like you. And that's a lot because I'm a child therapist. Um, and then you see Stitch and you're like, oh my gosh, like he's worse. Like, oh my gosh, this little crazy alien. Um, but it's funny. There's a quote that I really like uh, by Jessica Stevens. It says, there's no such thing as a bad kid. Just angry, hurt, tired, scared, confused, impulsive ones expressing their feelings and needs the only way they know how. We owe it to every single one of them to always remember that. Um, I also wanted to share a scripture, uh, Colossians 1, 21 uh, through 23. This is from Paul. He says, and you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present to you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight if indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard which was preached to every creature under heaven of which i paul became a minister um i like that last line too where he says of which i paul became a minister because we all know paul was like he's he's murdering Christians. Like let's just let's just throw that out there. And now he, who was once so wicked and alienated, is now like a, a servant of the Lord. I feel like that really speaks to how we can all be changed. And I love seeing the the transformation in Lilo and Stitch in this movie. Yeah, because they're both great character growth throughout mm -hmm. this whole movie. We have the chaos in both of their lives, mm -hmm. and then. The more time that they spend with each other, the more that they're surrounded, becoming a family community. And we were talking a little bit earlier, uh, Rebecca and I, about those influences have great impact on behavior, um, emotions, and uh, honestly, it can be very pivotal moments in our life that shape our features. At the beginning of Lilo's scene where she has that big tantrum, and yeah. she's freaking out and she's like every day i feed punch the fish a peanut butter sandwich and <laughs> do you know what's in tuna fish it would be an abomination um <laughs> and this isn't my original thought i found this in multiple sources but something that was really struck me is um when they ask why is this so important to you lilo because she's freaking out she says pudge controls the weather and you later find out that I don't know why I'm getting emotional. This is so silly. Um, you later find out that her parents died in a storm and um, got to a crack stint. And so she and her little six year old brain was like, Pudge controls the weather. I need to feed him this peanut butter sandwich. Or like, you don't know what's going to happen. Um, and so that's just an example of like her having a big tantrum, but there's something so much deeper underneath. Right. Um, and I didn't really like connect the two until I read your note about that. And it makes a lot of sense. Kids, and, and I think I did this as a kid as well, is we have certain rituals that we, um, that we develop because of the traumatic experience in our lives. So with Lilo in this case, as long as she feeds Pudge um, a peanut butter sandwich, he controls the weather, he's gonna, she's going to get in his good graces, you know, the line of thinking, and that the weather's going to be safe. Nobody will ever, you know, be harmed by that again because she's fulfilled her ritual. That's good. Yeah, mm -hmm. I saw y'all's ep uh, y'all's episode on the Mar uh, Monsters Inc. and OCD. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes, that reminds me of that a lot. That's what I was thinking about. It's a very, um, uh, you know, that's a tendency of or sign of OCD is having those rituals. And those intrusive thoughts of if I do this, then this will happen. Mm -hmm. It's a contract that you believe, um, and it ultimately goes back to to legalism um, and a works based mentality for um, you know, in the theological sense, in salvation, 
if I do these things, then God will love me and he will accept me into the family. Oh, yes. That was and, a very big thing growing up in the Pentecostal church because yeah. I felt my faith was just a checklist as I did it in the Bible. Did I go to youth group? Yeah. Did I, you know, do devotional? Okay, I did all this and this. Not mm -hmm. only now will God love me, but my pastor and the leadership will yeah. love me too. I love that. I feel like you see that in Nani's love for Lilo and also mm -hmm. Lilo's love for Stitch is like, yeah. like even with the bad meter, it's like, it's not a condition. Like I'm going to love you either way, but right. like, we, we got to right. work on that, dude. Like <laughs> your bad level is kind of high, but she <laughs> continuously welcomes him into her family. And then with Nani, Lilo's like, is it our fault that you got fired? And she's like, no, he's a vampire. And you know, um, when, when she's like, I want a lobster. She's like, we have a dog door. We're getting a dog. Like she's very, I feel like Nani handles Lilo so well in a lot of scenarios of, you know, you being good is not a condition of my love. Um, so yeah, I really feel like there's a lot of parallels there as well. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. You know, there's, there's, you know, being good. What, what is good? There's that big question, I think in the movie, it's kind of throughout the whole thing of what is goodness they they try to do like well uh elvis presley yeah, he was, was a model good. citizen yeah. he was a yeah. model citizen <laughs> yeah yes and that's so hilarious they, which is so funny mm -hmm. <laughs> like why why him i don't know um, he's the king or that guy's the king, king. yes <laughs> so funny. um well and i actually just thought of this he's the king and yet our eyes are supposed to be on the king that is who we are supposed to model our lives by is, is Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And um, by being in relationship with him, um, that is how we, you know, become more like Christ, really. It's, you know, cultivating our relationship with God will ultimately transform us from the inside out, which brings about true change. Um, I mean, that goes into Romans 12, 2, which is the renewing of your mind, the transforming. Um, and then Galatians 5, 22 through 23, which is the fruit of the spirit. And it's not that this confused me for a long time, and I'm sure it did other people. It's not necessarily that you have to like cultivate every single aspect of the fruit of the spirit. It's not like, oh, well, I'm lacking today in self-control. Got to work on that one. It's like, more so that Paul is saying, no, by being in the spirit, by cultivating that relationship, this is a byproduct of being in relationship. Because when you look at a, like a fruit tree, well, the tree is itself and it just, it produces fruit. It just is what it is. Um, it doesn't have to work at producing the fruit. It just produces it because of its being, what it is. And um, I think the same thing can be said for us. And that was really confusing for a long time. Yeah. I like how um, in the in the pound or the, is that what it was at a pound where she adopts it? I think so, yeah. I, I like how Nani is like, are you sure you want this one? And she's like, yes, he's good. I can tell. And she wanted him and no one else wanted him. And I love that everyone was like, no. And she's like, yeah, he's good. I can tell. And I, I thought, to myself, like, that's how I think some of us, we sometimes feel like God's like, yep, she's good. I could tell. And I'm like, but am I though? Like, you know what I mean? Um, and I feel like the Lord sees us, you know, as good because Christ died for us and he took our sins. And it, it's hard for us. Like you said, it's confusing. It's hard for us to see ourselves that way. Absolutely. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. I was actually just thinking about that this morning. Mm -hmm. um, during a devotional time. Well, it was a journal time. It wasn't devotional. Um, you know, there's some days today was one of these days where I was like, I think it would actually be worse for me to sit down and read the Bible. I need to sit down and I need a journal and I need to talk to God. Obviously reading your Bible is good. That cultivates that relationship, but also journaling mm -hmm. or walking and talking to God or whatever it is that works for you. Painting, mm -hmm. being in relationship, Sometimes those are more important than simply sitting down to read your Bible. So, so yeah, I, so during my time um, this morning, you know, I was thinking about, well, I was thinking about lots of things, but this came up in my journal time of what is good? Am I good? 
I... Dang, those are heavy questions for the morning. Yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I was dealing with some heavy subjects in myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I won't burden everyone with exactly what was going <laughs> on, but you know, I I wrote in my journal. People say that I'm so nice, but I see a different person. I really want to believe that I'm that sweet and kind person, and sometimes I do see it um, often, but like underneath. I just really, I see um, that my depravity is so great and that really it's like the kindness and love that's inside of me is Jesus, not me. And the real me is a worthless human who can't be good on her own. And I can only be good because God is a part of me now. This perspective (laughs) is, uh, it's not great. Um, there's, you know, you can see lots of self-hatred that's Mm. in there, um, which is not helpful really for anyone because we are, and we're the most effective when we acknowledge our capacity for good, um, and for evil, uh, both of those Mm. in and of ourselves that we have the capacity for good, um, not just for evil. So Mm. I think it's kind of dangerous to, to lean only in one side mm. of of the story there of thinking, ah, oh, we're evil and we've got to, mm-hmm. um, I don't know, it's only because of Jesus that we can be, that we can be good. Um, and, you know, it made me think about, um, you know, we have no way to restore that lost relationship apart, um, the lost relationship with God apart from Jesus. Like there is no other way. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, So that is constant. But just because we need Jesus, does that mean that we are automatically bad? I don't know. I I don't think so. Um, And I've been reading a lot about, uh, ah, what is the word? Penile substitution. Yeah, yes. P- yeah, penal substitution is the theory um, as a result of atonement. There we go. That's the word I was looking for. Um, so in at- when you're looking at atonement, um, yeah, there's different views about mm-hmm. how, how we deal with atonement. Um, and the prevailing thought right now is penal substitution, um, which came about as a result of chival- chivalry in, um, in the 12th century. And uh, mm-hmm. one of the books I was reading I was that I was talking about earlier, the integration book, um, they say, they explain chivalry as um, when a person's honor was broken, there are two options that you have. Um, there's satisfaction by offering something greater in kind to the result mm-hmm. or punishment. Mm-hmm. God chose the path of satisfaction. So it's like with, with penal substitution, it seems like that means that we are inherently bad. That's kind of what I'm looking at it as. Um, and that's the prevailing view right now in Christianity is the penal substitution theory in atonement. And um, it's got a lot of criticism from from theologians and, and people in general. Um, it can cause a lot of issues um, in, in individuals that, that ultimately bring them to the counseling room. Yeah, that's interesting. I want to think about that some more. Um, are you, what's your, do you have, a, do you know your Myers-Briggs or any of your personality types? A little bit. Yeah. Myers-Briggs, a, I know some of them. Are you, what do you know yours? Oh my gosh. What am I? Is it the, <laughs> I'm not the creative one. Um, Cause I'm not, I think are I'm. You the, an, are you an introvert? I waffle back and forth. <laughs> I'm both introvert and extrovert. <laughs> You're an introvert. Um, Something I love about introverts is they're very deep thinkers. And oh. so I'm an extrovert and I do feel like uh, it's easier for me to have simple faith. I'm just like, oh, that's just how it is. And I'm like fine with that. I don't need all the answers. And then you get those like hard hitter questions. And I'm like, whoa, I've never thought about that that deeply, which maybe I should ha- should think that deeply about it because it's like, do you mind sharing a little bit about what 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 would it mean for you to to say I am inherently bad and I need Jesus? Yeah. So what makes me? Why do I believe I am inherently bad? Well, what would that mean if it were true? If it were true, hmm, it's what I see now. 
honestly, I see the, um, the, my, my thoughts are not always pure and I hold myself to a very high standard. And I know that's not realistic, Mm -hmm. um, because we can't control the thoughts that come into our brain and, uh, we can only, it's what we do with those thoughts that Mm -hmm. show up that means anything. One of the things that I wrote about in that same journal entry this morning actually was was about my thoughts that mm-hmm. like because my thoughts were um, mm-hmm. were evil, mm-hmm. that meant I am evil. And I thought about the verse, I forget where it is now, but it's Jesus is saying, um, you know, if you, I say, if you lust after a woman with as a lustful intent, then you've already committed adultery. And so I was in my mind thinking, okay, because I have this thought that, that means that I've already committed the sin it's done. And I had to rein it back in, in, in my journaling time to say, no, Jesus is saying that if you have a lustful intent, lustful, that means you're, you're ruminating, ruminating on it. You're thinking about it. You're meditating on it. And then intent, meaning that you intend to do something about it. And that's very different than just a random little thought passing through your head. He's definitely always looking at our hearts. It actually just made me think of Stitch. Like he was created for destruction. So to be inherently bad I don't think it's a permanent sentence and I think that's okay. Like I I'm okay with the with the with the idea that maybe we're born bad in sin nature and you know we're born to this world with sin nature. Um just like Stitch was born into this or created into this earth as made for nothing but destruction and you will never belong. That just wasn't true. Jim, Jumbo said you will never belong. Um so despite being born for destruction um he ended up changing his ways and finding family and relying on Lino and finding a place where he belonged and, you know, make, creating his own ugly duckling story. Um, I also think going back to therapy, I think of like, you know, addicts, you know, when you're in a really dark place with addiction and you're living very selfishly and you're, you know, sometimes almost ruining your life and like hurting your families. Um, the redemption story from that is usually even more beautiful to to see that someone came from like the lowest of the low and they were able to restore that and become someone completely changed and new and get their life back together to me that's an even more powerful story so to go from sinful and horrible i almost think is more powerful than to just well i'm just good and jesus is a bonus but i don't know what are your thoughts on that yeah it's an interesting um interesting thought i i would have said Honestly, before this morning, I would have said something very similar of, um, you know, we are that, yes, we are inherently bad. And maybe I think there's some truth to that, that our, it's our sin nature. And I think, I, I think it might be more productive to talk about the sin nature being bad, but not necessarily who we are. Yeah. Um, and it's for everyone, it's different. You know, uh, everybody has a different view on things. Um, I just know for me, I am way more inclined to self-hatred than, um, you know, maybe other people are. So that resonates with me, but it might be helpful for somebody else. Um, like we were talking about earlier with those redemptive analogies for different cultures um, and different people groups, different things for different people. Um, mm-hmm. So I think there's, there's, I don't think there's any one right way to look at it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's lots of different perspectives that we can bring in. Um, actually, mm-hmm. one of the perspective I was reading about in the book about atonement, mm-hmm. um, there's one called kaleidoscope. Um, yeah. And so I it's like- that. Have you? Yeah. So it's Mm -hmm. like looking at all different views, recognizing where we're all coming from, um, Mm -hmm. kind of integrating um, all of that together. I think about that a lot, actually, because I've looked at different um, 
theologies and different um, denominations. I said there are, that was actually something that was frustrating for me in seminary because I like to just, just what's the answer and I'm just going to go with it. Um, so it was kind of frustrating sometimes learning the different uh, denominations and theologies because it was like, oh, I don't know which one's right. And I don't want to be so ignorant to say which one is right. So I feel like for me, when I say simple faith, I'm like, I know the foundation and I feel like the Lord will answer the rest when I die. And I'm kind of okay with that. Uh, going back to OCD, it's kind of like being okay and accepting of uncertainty. Um, like the, the rest will fill itself out. Um, and I guarantee when I die, God's going to correct me. I think he's going to correct all of us on some things. Like he's going to be like, he's going to be like, he, cause like Christian culture, right. He's going to be like, what were you? I never said that. Like, why were you saying that I said that? And I'm going to be like, I'm so sorry, Jesus. Like, I really thought that that's what you said. Um, so, and I'm okay with that. I, I'm going to, I'm going to speak what I believe and, I'm going to believe what I believe and whatever he corrects me on, he'll correct me on. I'll find out when I die. And I, and the intention go going back to what you said about the intention. My heart is to speak the truth. And I believe God knows that my heart is to speak the truth and I will gladly accept correction if he tells me otherwise. Yeah. I think that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Honestly, yeah. I think being open and like, you know, okay, we got the basics, Jesus, mm -hmm. the way, the truth and the life. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, up to, um, well, what's interesting is that Jesus didn't, he didn't give us a user manual necessarily The it, while he was here on earth. He talked a lot about the kingdom. What does a kingdom look like? Um, taught us how to pray. He taught us, um, you know, those kinds of things, which are all incredibly important, obviously. Uh, but then, you know, we see most, the rest of the New Testament after the gospels is the new church just trying to figure it out? Like, yeah. what does this look like? What Which does this look cool. like as a new Christian? Yeah, he it is. He wanted us to think critically. Like, he mm -hmm. he never gave a straight answer. He always gave a workaround so that you could figure it out on your own. Which is mm -hmm. kind of nice because earlier we talked about, you know, you want to meet people where they're at and you want to help them think for themselves. You don't want to just be like, this is the right way because no one responds well to that. Um, right. So I think there is some freedom in that, which is kind of cool. But yeah, it, it, it is very important to, you know, meet people where they're at, um, speak truth and speak love. And if they want to hear it, great. If they don't, well, God will, you know, deal with that. Um, that's between them and God. And I feel that that's a very important thing of what we do each week. We're not here to convert. We're not here to... Um, you know, show religion, definitely not religion down anybody's throat, but we're here to open the um, conversation to, you know, maybe things that you haven't thought about before. And mm -hmm. if you come for the faith-based stuff, great. If you only come for the animation stuff, that's great too. We just want to present that message in a new mm -hmm. and entertaining way. Well, yeah, and it goes along with what we were talking about earlier as, you know, sharing the gospel as being a state of being. Yes. Um, rather than simply, you know, browbeating people. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a conversation. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. The, um, you know, I was thinking earlier about the really first and only time I've ever been um, privileged to be a part of someone accepting the gospel. Mm. I honestly, when I was talking with this person, I mm. thought that they already were. I just kind of assumed. Oh, wow. I was just like, yeah, whatever. Just sharing what God was doing in my life at the time, what was going mm. on. And then, and then they started asking questions about faith and mm. I was like, Oh, okay. So, and then it was like, Oh, okay. Here's the moment. Here's what we've been preparing for. Mm. <laughs> but the point mm. is that God had already done like all of the work. Basically yeah. I was there for the last 5% of oh, coming yeah. to salvation and mm -hmm. um that it was just such an amazing experience but just i think that that just backs up the idea of being i was literally just being who i was chatting about what god was doing and god just was amazing and used that to bring that other person um that i was talking with to himself and um it was such a beautiful beautiful process. Um, but yeah, I think we're, we're doing that. I hope we're doing that here on the podcast of just like 
sharing our heart. Like these are just the things that we think about, you know, we don't purposefully try to, um, I don't know, do anything really, really specific other than relating it to Christian themes. Yeah. And I don't, and I don't think we're going to be sad or, you know, distraught when somebody says, yeah, I listened to you. And I really started thinking about God. It's like, Oh gosh, I did it again. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it, for me, it takes the pressure off. Um, a lot of times I'll pray that like the Holy spirit will be present. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, it takes the pressure off of like, it's all his work and he gets all the glory and I'm just a vessel and I'm happy with that role because if they, if they come to Christ, that's super exciting and I'll rejoice. Mm -hmm. And if I don't like, that's not my responsibility, you know, at the end of the day, um, it's going to be between, like you said, them and God. So we've gone a lot of different places (laughs) um, in the conversation, but (laughs) um, again, that's what you guys get on the podcast. We, we have thoughts and we go, go wherever, um, you know, it leads us now. um, I, Almost called you Lilo. I, <laughs> <laughs> Today she is Lilo. Yes. <laughs> um, but uh, Paris, were there any other points that you want that you want to make sure that we addressed um, in terms of this uh, film? I did. I think this is actually a good closing point too. Actually, um, it's uh, when Lilo says a powerful quote to Stitch. She says, "Family means nobody gets left behind. But if you want to leave, you can." I'll remember you though. I remember everyone that leaves. And I feel like in the same way, um, the Lord doesn't force us into his presence. He always remembers us and he knows each and every one of us. But at the end of the day, it's our choice mm-hmm. whether he, we want to be in his presence or not. And I, I do think that's a beautiful thing because I think true love is a choice. It's not forceful. Right. It's not demanding. It's, you know, if you want to be in my presence, all are welcome. Yeah. Um, and if you want to leave, you can. Uh, I've, I've always heard it said that um, God is a is a gentleman. He's not going to, you know, burst in the doors. Um, he's going to wait for you to open that door and let yes, him in. Yes, I like that analogy. Um, it's uh, the same verse. It's like, and I, and I stand at the door and I knock, and mm-hmm. whoever opens the door, I'll come mm-hmm. in. Mm-hmm. It's also the verse in a uh, Tony Mac psalm. So there you go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like that. Yeah, I love that. And I love too that we 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 haven't even mentioned that quote, the Ohana. Ohana means family and family means nobody gets left behind or forgotten. That's such a big part of the uh of the movie. Um and so beautiful. And the whole theme of family, um everything as you said, is such an integral part to this movie because mm-hmm. it's like the second biggest theme. Because we have Nani, who is starting to be both a sister and a parental figure to Lilo. Yeah. And then we have the added stress of Mr. Bubbles coming in <laughs> and um, trying to assess the situation. And the most heartbreaking scene yeah. is where um, John and Trickley have been let go of the operation according to the Galactic Alliance Federation. And John is like, we're going to do this my way. They go in, and um, Lilo calls uh, Mr. Bubbles, a aliens that are attacking the house, and the fire department comes in. Nani gets there, and she's like, listen, uh, you know, we just need a little bit more time. Uh, Mr. Bubbles says, oh, gosh. So, she says she it, needs it, it, me. Yeah, yeah. Is this what she needs? It seems clear to me that you need her a lot more than she needs you. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, gosh. Mm. Same. Yeah. I was like, ah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a silent sob. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, I think we could all doubt, you know, <clears throat> the term Ohana because, you know, family is forever, basically, um, in terms of, you know, you don't get to choose who your family is. You get to choose to love them and like them and whatnot. But they're a part of who you are, and you should never forget, you know, then it's part of that unconditional um, love that we talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. So. There are so many. I think we hit some pretty good themes. So you could, there's so many other themes, right? Yeah, that we, so we, could, we could be here for <laughs> it could be like yeah. a five hour, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, that's, and that's, the, that's why we kind of keep these down to one to two themes, because there are mm-hmm. so many things we could go um, mm-hmm. off on. 
Paris, we have enjoyed having you on this episode. For those of you who want to follow you, keep up with what you're doing, where can they follow you? Yeah, you can follow me on all platforms at Paris Cosplays. All right, and we also have uh, links uh, to her socials down in the description. So you go all ahead, check her out, show her some love. Until next time, keep those halos shiny and stay old in there, friends.